Hey everyone, now we're gonna take a look at the lymphatic system, their diseases and disorders. Now with the lymphatic system, let's do a little review of the anatomy and physiology. Remember the lymphatic system is composed of the lymph nodes, the lymph vessels, as well as some lymph ducts. So a lot of times if you see lymph in it, we're obviously talking about the lymphatic system. Now, if you'll notice that these particular structures, especially the vessels, run through the body very similar to how your arteries and veins run. This is because they are going to help send fluids and stuff back to the cardiovascular system that got lost um, because the veins were not able to get as much of it back as the arteries were able to put out. Now, these lymph nodes are normally concentrated in areas where connections take place in the body. So you see them here in the neck, you see them in the underarm area, the growing, as well as along a lot of the structures where things could potentially gain access, like your lungs, your digestive system, that sort of thing. Now, the point of these lymphatic structures is to protect the body from infection and it does this by per, by filtering bacterial and non-bacterial products from its fluid now it does this by having some special tissue that we call reticular tissue that's found in the lymph nodes the lymph nodes are able to filter trap and then destroy these foreign invaders it also prevents waste products from entering back into the circulatory system now, this particular system is very dependent on the vascular system. So it's very dependent on that part of the cardiovascular system, which is the vessels. Now, lymph is normally a pretty clear type of fluid, and it's going to be added back into the cardiovascular system, specifically back dumped back into the veins here in the subclavian veins, and then it turns back into the plasma of the blood. Now guys, this picture right here kind of shows you how the lymphatic vessels are actually going to be intertwined with those capillary beds. You can see that the arteries are coming in one way and you have the veins on the other side and they are connected in those capillary beds. They're there to deliver oxygen and nutrients to the cells, pick up waste products from the cells. But in this process, due to the arteries having high pressure, some of the fluid gets pushed out into between the cells. Well, that fluid needs to be collected so that we don't have excess of swelling in our tissues and the lymphatic system is going to help with that. It's going to help pull up that extra fluid to try to help with the swelling and edema in between our tissues. Okay, and you can see them shown here in the green. Now these are not color coded in the body, although that would make it really easy to find these structures if they were. Now there's two kind of divisions with the lymphatic system. We see that there's the right lymphatic duct. This drains the lymph from your head your upper torso and your right arm, and it's gonna drain it back into the subclavian on that right side. The left lymphatic duct is also known as the thoracic duct, and it's going to have all the fluids from the rest of the body drained through that duct into the left subclavian vein. All right, and so we do see that they're gonna drain in this area, but one is gonna be on the right side, and that's the right lymphatic duct, and the other's on the left side, which is the, what we call thoracic duct. Now, some other organs that are related to the lymph system are gonna be things like your tonsils. Again, they're in an area where things could gain access. Your thymus gland, which is gonna help train your um, T cells of your lymphocytes that we talk about, and then also your spleen. Your spleen is a reserve of blood, and in that particular area, we see that lymphocytes are going to be present in pretty large amounts. So the spleen also has some of that structure that the lymph nodes have. Now, some common signs and symptoms that we see in these issues with the lymphatic system are enlarged lymph glands or nodes. We see that they're enlarged and this is why they can palpate them. So when you go to the doctor and they, they look at the fact that, they're, that they think they're swelling, they'll kind of palpate in here. What they're doing is they're feeling for those lymph nodes to see if they're enlarged. We also see that they'll have, the patient normally will have fever, fatigue, and even weight loss. Most diseases of the lymphatic system are related to diseases actually from other systems. The lymphatic system just is affected by those other diseases. Now there are some things that we can look for when we talk about with blood tests, when we talk specifically about certain white blood cells called lymphocytes. If the white blood cell count is increased and it's high, we call this lymphocytosis. Okay, so, or we also can call it leukocytosis where it's high levels of white blood cells. 
Okay, on the other hand, we, we also have lymphocytopenia, which is decreased amount of white blood cells. Also, it could be termed as leukocytopenia. Okay, so if our blood tests come back and we have too many white blood cells, it's the cytosis. If we have too little, it's the penia. So some diagnostic tests. Well, of course, we could do a complete blood count like we just talked about, and this is with a differential, specifically the white blood cell differential. We could also do a lymphoangiography. This is gonna be where we take an X-ray of the lymph system, but we have to use dye to inject through those vessels in order to get a good picture. We also see that you could use an MRI or CT scan, and also taking biopsies of the lymph nodes are important, especially when we talk about certain types of cancer, because the lymphatic system ends up being a highway that cancer cells can take and travel to far off places when it metastasizes. Lymphadenitis, which is inflammation of the lymph glands themselves, or the lymph nodes. Now, symptoms for this are swelling, pain, tenderness in the lymph gland or node, or both. And so a lot of times, again, this is when they sit there and they palpate and we're looking for tenderness and swelling. Sometimes you might have a feeling in your underarm or your groin area where it's tender and inflamed. This could actually be where a lymphocyte this is where actually a lymph node was able to capture something and it's working on fighting that infection. And so this is normally due to some type of infection. Now diagnosis, we would do a conf we would get this confirmed with a biopsy if it becomes too severe. However, a lot of times this may resolve on its own. Okay, if not, we may need to remove those lymph nodes. And this is something that can also happen like with your tonsils or your adenoids if they become constantly inflamed. They would need to be removed. And again, a lot of times they would do this with sometimes a biopsy to see what the active infection was. The next one we have is lymphangitis. This is swelling of the lymph vessel itself due to inflammation. So this isn't the lymph node yet, it's just the vessel of that lymphatic vessel that is inflamed. This is caused most of the time by a strep infection that happens after some sort of trauma. And it is specifically characterized by a red streak at the bacterial entry. And so wherever it entered, we see there's a red streak that forms as it's traveling up through those lymphatic vessels to a lymph node. And you can see that here in the picture. It's distinguished by that red line traveling through that lymphatic vessel. Some other symptoms could also cause fevers, chills, malaise, and it could progress into cellulitis, which is going to be that inflammation of those underlining layers of the skin, which can become life-threatening if that infection continues into if that infection continues into the blood. Now, this is actually very easy to diagnose because the patient tends to have a very high fever and that characteristic red streak that you see here. Now treatment could be antibiotics, especially if it's a strep infection, which is the most common cause. We also see that a warm, moist packs might be used to help an elevation of the affected area to help reduce swelling. The next one is lymphedema. Lymphedema is an abnormal collection of lymph fluid in your extremities. This means your lymphatic vessels are not able to collect the fluid like they're supposed to and return it back to the cardiovascular system. So we see a swelling that takes place in the extremities, whether it's the arms or the legs. Now, some possible causes of this could be surgery. When we talk about surgeries, this could be surgeries in certain lymph vessels. It could also be a surgery, especially like with breast cancer, where they remove the breast tissue and also remove some of the lymph nodes. That could potentially cause lymphedemia to take place in the, that arm that's affected. We also see liposuction could increase the chances of lymphedemia. We also see radiation treatments could be a problem or increased cause. Pregnancy, now pregnancy is due to the baby putting kind of like a kink in the hose. So those lymphatic vessels are kinked up due to the pressure that the baby puts on those vessels. Burns, because there's a lot of times a fluid shift that takes place, and then traumas. Now the main symptoms, of course, is the edema, that swelling that you can see here in the pictures. Now you can see that in the first picture, you don't have as severe swelling, but there is a difference between their two arms or their two legs. However, in the last picture, you can see it's very severe type of lymphedema. Now with lymphedema, it does also cause heaviness in the extremity. Now treatment, if it is caused by a bacterial type of infection, antibiotics may need to take place. 
We may also use compression therapy, and this is to help push the fluid back out of those areas. And surgical intervention may need to be done depending on the cause. Certain causes could be due to like a scar tissue buildup or extra tissue that's causing a obstruction. Those would need to be removed in order to restore flow through those vessels. We now have lymphoma. Lymphoma, guys, is a neoplasm. This is a cancer that affects the lymphoid tissue. It affects the normal lymphocytes. They're not going to do their normal job. Their production is impaired, which impairs immunity. And this is talked about in patho 1. We see that there's that Hodgkin's lymphoma versus non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. There's some differences. And one of the main differences is just microscopically looking at a biopsy. If Reed-Sternberg cells are present, then that's a type of Hodgkin's lymphoma. And so we can look for a specific thing. This is the most common type of blood cancer though in the United States, okay? So out of all the blood cancers out there, lymphoma is the most common. Another thing that's part of this um, kind of system that where the lymphatic system is affected is mononucleosis. This is also known as mono or infectious mononucleosis. It is a viral infection and it's specifically caused by the Epstein-Barr virus. Okay, so it's specifically caused by the Epstein-Barr virus. This is a big issue in children and in young adults. It is somewhat contagious, but it's also known as the kissing disease. Now, you can get it without just kissing an individual who has Epstein-Barr. It could also be due to like sharing drinks, utensils, things like that. So it is passed a lot of times though through the saliva in one way or another. Patients who have mono tend to be very fatigued. They'll have a sore throat and some swelling like you can see there due to the lymph nodes that are in the area. They swell up due to the infection. We see fever. They also can have a swollen spleen, which is called a splenomegaly. And that is really life-threatening, though, if it were to rupture because it is a reservoir of blood, so you could bleed out very quickly if the spleen gets enlarged and ruptures. So how do we treat this? Most of the time with mono, the treatment is going to be symptomatic. So rest is kind of the main thing because remember it's a virus, so we cannot treat it with antibiotics. Making sure the person gets fluids, maybe some painkillers if they're dealing with pain. Um, avoiding like strenuous types of activities or even contact activities if their spleen is enlarged. Because again, that could increase the chance of rupture. And one way to help prevent this, of course, is hand washing and then obviously not sharing like drinks and um, utensils. Now, again, I'm not going to say you can't kiss anybody, but just know you are taking that risk. If somebody does have Epstein-Barr, they can pass mono on to you as well. And this is actually a pretty common viral infection for most people. A lot of times it's very mild or asymptomatic, but for some it can cause some major complications and issues. Some rare diseases. One of the rare diseases that's part of the lymphatic system is Kawasaki's disease. This is also known as mucocutaneous lymph node syndrome. It's an acute fibril disease that is found mostly in children. So it affects kids. It causes high fevers to take place. Symptoms include rash, similar to that of scarlet fever. They may have edema in their feet and hands, again, because it is affecting the lymphatic system, which is the drainage of that fluid. They'll be lethargic. They may have some congestion, irritability, of course, the fever, which we talked about with it being fibril, dry skin, but then we also see that there can be a reddened lips, tongue, and mucous membranes. And their tongue will actually kind of look like a strawberry. Okay, you can see the strawberry type tongue that is very common with Kawasaki disease. Now, the treatment here is supportive. We've got to support their body in fighting this particular type of issue because it's kind of a complication that can occur. Most children, though, survive this, but there could be complications later. Years after and about with Kawasaki's disease, they could actually die, children could die from coronary artery disease because damage to their coronary arteries could occur during this syndrome. 
All right, so what are the effects of aging that we see with the lymphatic system? Well, we see a decreased ability to produce antibodies. As this is due to the fact that those lymphocytes cannot fight like they did before. So this makes the patient more prone to infections as they age. There's also an increased susceptibility to autoimmune disorders, where our immune system forgets what we look like versus an invader. And so it starts attacking you yourself instead of the invaders it should be fighting. And of course, then an impaired vascular system that happens as we age would also impact the lymphatic system. So if the vascular system with like congestive heart failure or coronary artery disease or other issues we talked about back in the cardiovascular chapter come into play, swelling and other lymphatic issues may also happen because they are closely linked, kind of like we saw with the respiratory system and the cardiovascular system. All right, and so these are just some examples of effects of aging on the lymphatic system. All right, that's it for this one. So if you have any questions, please let me know.